Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for tonight's Memorials, Monuments, and Memory Lecture at Roanoke College. My name is Justine Ludwig, and I am the Executive Director of Creative Time, a public arts organization that works with artists to contribute to the dialogues, debates, and dreams of our times. Sponsored by the Center for Studying Structures of Race at Roanoke College and co-presented by Creative Time, the Memorials, Monuments, and Memory Lecture Series brings to Roanoke's campus a number of artists, architects, and scholars whose work addresses the roles of monuments and memorials in society. Presented in tandem with the spring INQ 300 capstone course by the same name, the series invites students and the public to examine the intersection of art, public memory, and history. The series also precedes planning for the school's commission of a new memorial commemorating the enslaved persons who built the college and contributed to the wider region. The memorial will be developed and presented jointly by the college and creative time. I'd like to thank Jesse Booker, director for the study of Center and Structures of Race at Rona College for the time and effort he has devoted to bringing this series to fruition. It has been wonderful to be present for this series of past lectures from artists Hugh Locke and Charles Gaines, cultural historian and architectural designer Mabel O. Wilson, and historical archaeologist Dr. Whitney Battle Baptiste. Now, without further ado, I would like to give a warm welcome to tonight's speaker, Karen Olivier. Olivier was born in Trinidad and Tobago, creates sculptures, installations, and public art. In 2023 and 2024, Olivier will unveil two memorials in Philadelphia, honoring a former slave at Stenton House and commemorating more than 5,000 African Americans buried at Bethel Burying Ground. Last year, Olivier participated in Documenta 15 and installed a permanent commission for Newark's airport's new terminal. Olivier has exhibited at the Guangzhou and Busan Biennial, the World Festival for Black Arts and Culture in Dakar, Senegal, the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of Art, MoMA PS1, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Contemporary Art Museum Houston, the Mattress Factory, Sculpture Center, the ICA Watershed, among others, including a Creative Time Project. Solo exhibitions include Everything That's Alive Moves at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Philadelphia in 2020, a closer look at the Lauermeyer Sculpture Park in St. Louis in 2007. Olivier presented her first solo exhibition at Tanya Benoctor Gallery in New York in 2021. Olivier has received numerous awards, including the 2020 Anonymous Was a Woman Award, a John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Award, the New York Foundation for the Arts Award, the Paula Krasner Foundation Grant, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Award, a 2019 Pew Fellowship, a Creative Capital Grant, and a Harpo Foundation Grant, just to name a few. At the con conclusion of her lecture, Olivier will take questions moderated by Jesse. To take part, please use the Q&A feature located at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Karen Olivier, thank you for your presence here tonight and for continuing this lecture series with us today. As I've told you, I'm a big fan of your work, so I'm absolutely thrilled to be here for your lecture tonight. I'll pass the mic off to you. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. Okay, I'm going to, how do I do this again? Are you seeing the screen? Are you seeing an image? We are. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the 16th century talking statues of Rome. And a friend in passing just mentioned them to me and it felt like a revelation. These anonymous messages were attached to this group of six statues. This is the original one, it's called Pasquino. And the messages were left by the public. They kind of reinvented these statues as sites for protest, political dissent, for critique and commentary on the religious and political authorities at the time. You know, these effigies became the spokespeople of Rome. You know, at times responses were posted between statues, creating this kind of ongoing 
dialogue between multiple histories and shifting authors, the statuary became active and mutable and contemporary. Here's another iteration. I love this one, the Pasquino, someone adorned it with this placard that the translation is, it is no longer the moment to obey, defend your destiny with strength. Even at the expense of dying, don't let yourself be treated like a puppet. So these stat talking statues inform the first project I'd like to share with you all. So in 2016, I was invited by Mural Arts and Monument Lab to participate in a citywide exhibition. And the artists were charged with the question, you know, what is the appropriate monument for the city of Philadelphia? And we were asked to make um, what they were calling prototypes. And I was intrigued by two monuments in historic Vernon Park, which is a couple blocks away from my home. So this monument here is dedicated to Francis Daniel Pistorius. And he was an early German settler to the neighborhood that's known as Germantown. And he led the first Quaker protests against slavery in 1688, so almost 200 years before it was abolished. I found out in my research that during World War I and II, this monument was concealed, it was boxed over. It was felt that the language and the look was too Germanic. So the other monument that's in the park, this one's centrally located. This is the Battle of Germantown Memorial, and it commemorates an American Revolutionary War battle led by George Washington. So I was interested in the fact that it honors a failed battle, which of course speaks to power, privilege and access, who gets to have a monument, um, who's deemed worthy. You know, I was also interested in, you know, Francis's immigrant, Francis Pistorius, you know, who's fighting for the freedom of blacks, of slaves in this country, but wasn't considered, you know, American enough to continually honor. And then thinking at the same time about Washington and how we, he was fighting for America's liberation from British rule while owning slaves. So I was thinking about, you know, the complexity of this kind of the paradox and the, of these disparate histories that kind of make up America. So I wanted to kind of use that history as, in, in my intervention, use that kind of as my, for my proposition. So I decided to shroud the Battle of Germantown Memorial in a mirrored surface, in effect, boxing it up like the Pistorius Memorial was in years past. And I hope the physical concealment with this reflective surface would allow the monument to feel expansive and accessible and maybe less intimidating than kind of the colossal nature and the material weightiness usually permit. You know, I was also interested in invisibility. You know, depending on your location in the park, the monuments seem to disappear. And I wanted it to be in direct, you know, conversation with or engaging the Confederate monument debate that I think is still pretty alive in this country. And the piece was installed about a week after the, 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 the um, rally in, um, in Charlottesville, Virginia, where the neo-Nazi rally, where the peaceful protesters were, were run down. And the piece kind of changed its meaning. It became almost like a call to arms. But I was interested in, you know, what invisibility reveals you know, what does invisibility bring to the fore? What does it challenge? You know, what does it suggest about notions of access and privilege? And then I started to think, you know, if we choose to spotlight what was previously hidden now, like how does it shift the legacy and the future of the status quo? You know, it's, an, it's a neighborhood park. And, you know, I was thinking how these kind of monolithic, imposing, impenetrable sculptures and how, you know, most park goers maybe take them in from perhaps this physical or metaphoric distance. Perhaps they think the statue is related to someone else's history um, with maybe little meaning in their own lives. You know, but it's also a park where, you know, park goes have passed it hundreds of times. I mean, I have. And maybe they only register it, maybe almost, almost marginally re register it after all those repeat encounters. So maybe now I can make something where the familiar becomes strange or uncanny. You know, often in my work, I'm, I'm engaging with, trying to engage with multiple histories to reveal like the fragmentary nature in which we learn about the past and maybe also about the impossibility of a universal or, or an objective history. You know, so I hope to point to the fact that historical narratives can be conflicting. You know, our present, our present is grounded in these innumerable histories and continue to shift over time as new knowledge or research is um, unearthed. You know, I, I don't usually show this image, but I decided to do so. There's something about this, uh, this image, the piece feels a little frightening. I mean, for me, it's almost calling to mind the coldness that I associate with fascist monuments and architecture. But I think for me, it's useful to ponder how a change in the season from summer to late fall with this gray sky could still drastically change the tenor feel and maybe the reading of the monument. 
And I was thinking about how, how critical context is and, and how much it matters in us and, and the role it plays, what the significant role it plays in our interpretation of artworks. You know, but more optimistically, you know, I was, I wanted to reimagine this monument where now you could see the world, you know, around, above, behind you, reflected directly in front of you. You know, viewers could engage at different axes and disrupt the verticality we often associate with monuments, kind of allow it to be this kind of living, breathing entity. You know, ridding this monument of um, this kind of singular perspective, and we know this singular perspective is falsely represents a universal. So an amazing thing happened. Um, there's this um, uh, poet and historian, Trapita Mason. She was a poet laureate in Philadelphia two, three years ago. And she wrote a poem inspired by my piece. And I, I keep feeling as it's been like the biggest honor of my career for that to happen. I'm gonna, she's gonna be reading and I'm gonna play um, her reading the poem. Monuments to Brown Boys. The artists install the mirror over the monument and the people have come to gawk. Rubber neckers wonder what was there before, and you have come too, laying in the cut, statue still for seconds, your reflection edging off a 20-foot high bronze looking glass. You are an alluring hunk of stone beguiling me. Yes, you, brown boy, rough cut monolith, I see you. You are a low-slung, jean-wearing, grandmother-greeting pillar, an obelisk marking the entrance of your hood. You need to be somebody's memorial, not only when you laid out and lowered in the dirt, your pillow a marble headrest of past tense. He was, he once, he lived. No, you are now in present, alive and in color, and you need to be somebody's walking shrine, somebody's testament, somebody's tribute in this city. You have to be carved, stretched, and erect, a column to buttress boogeymen, the phantoms they say you imagine, the specters and goblins who told bullets and policies and laws that encase you. You need to be somebody's memento. Look how you beaming off that seeing glass. I'm catching your shine. Look at that swagger you carrying, hoodie wearing, fresh fade having, full teeth grinning. You need to be somebody's something to fight for, somebody's celebration, somebody's stone turned monument, carved and smooth, our masterpiece in this city. So in 2015, I was invited to be part of this exhibition of Creative Times in Central Park. And I was kind of daunted by the, the, the prospect, but I decided to just focus on the site of Central Park and maybe reveal what existed at that location. And maybe that act would allow for a reflection on what stands there today. So I decided to create a three flip lenticular billboard. You know, so I was reading about the Wisconsin glacier that traveled through what is now New York City 20,000 years ago. You know, it created valleys and moved boulders and formed rock outcroppings, carried debris that was eternally stranded in new locations when the ice sheet melted. And I was interested in this physical evidence, you know, this geological diaspora that can be found throughout Central Park. You know, it's both everywhere in plain sight, but it's also hidden by our lack of knowledge or awareness of it. I was also interested in the more recent history of the site, Seneca Village, and the fact that there's, you know, little evidence of this once, you know, vibrant community. You know, it was a settlement of mostly freed African-American residents in the 1800s, and they were pretty much displaced and scattered wholesale throughout the city when the decision was made to um, develop Central Park. You know, a few traces of the Tennessee are left in the Bucolic Park. So the billboard depicted an image of the glacier, but also a pottery shard that was found on the side of the village. And I saw this, you know, literal and metaphoric connection between the subtle residual artifacts of both the glacier and the village. The third image of the Lenticca was a photo of the actual landscape in the park, actually the landscape directly behind the billboard structure. You know, so when a viewer kind of moved from one end of the billboard to the other, the glacier would seem to morph into another time period. It was as if the park goers' movements were a controlling time or their understanding of it. The glacier mutates into a shard from a ceramic vessel, like this domestic object made from clay dug from the same earth the glacier traversed before it also vanished. You know, depending on the viewer's vantage point, you know, multiple iterations of the three images could be seen. At moments, each image is distinct, and other times they reveal, reveal themselves as fragments. 
And I wanted the, you know, the expansiveness of the glacier to be felt in contrast to the scale of the ceramic um, fragment. You know, I hope to somehow equate the two, you know, this massive larger than life physicality of the glacier with the smallness and the intimacy of a domestic object, you know, this kitchen plate. So what would it mean to position these two opposing scales and physicalities into the same image? And uh, uh, another thing that happened that was really interesting was that varying distances, the three images seemed to, to overlap and compress. It was almost as though I was conflating, the image was like conflating like 20,000 years of time into a single image. So this is a 1934 New Deal era fresco by Anne Weiss Hanlon, and it's been at the center of debate and controversy at the University of Kentucky for many years, I'd say about 30, 30 plus years. And viewed through contemporary eyes, the fresco sanitizes history, you know, glosses over the brutality, pain, and suffering that slavery imposed. It represents a caricature portrayal of Native Americans. And even though this image, this painting is uh, making reference to a specific incident that happened, it's the only one um, of a Native American in, in the mural. You know, you have the musicians playing for the white elite. You have this boy denied access to the performance venue, but he's kind of sneaking a peek from up in the tree. So, so in 2015, the president of the university decided to cloak the mural for about two years. And the hope was to kind of buy time to, for the campus community to maybe determine what to do next after all the protests, you know, that were prompted, I would say, mostly by black students on campus. So the decision was made to commission an artist um, to make a work that could challenge, confront, maybe jumpstart a corrective and, and, and hopefully a, a healing to the pain the contested mural caused. So in the vestibule of Memorial Hall, which is right outside the lobby entrance to where the, the mural is housed, I, when I was in that space, I noticed the dome ceiling and I was thinking, you know, this dome ceiling is about 16 feet um, in diameter, about 26 feet um, from, the, from the ground. And I decided I wanted to kind of use this as the kind of the, the crux of my, um, my piece. So to me, the dome raised interesting questions. You know, why was the space designed in this way? It wasn't mean to create a dome vestibule in an in a academic building. You know, domes date back to, you know, prehistory and have ties to, you know, indigenous building traditions, is, um, Byzantine, Islamic architecture. You know, so what symbolism does it have in a building designed for higher education? You know, my hope was, you know, to have this kind of initial, you know, recognition to the particularity of the spaces we inhabit, but maybe that initial thought would kind of lead to other questions. You know, I, I, I turn to James Baldwin, as many of us do, and I think about his assessment of the role of art is, is to expose the question the answer hides. So I decided to gild the dome ceiling and inserted painting reproductions, reproductions of all the black and brown figures from the fresco. And so I created copies of each figure and I scaled them up proportionately to fit comfortably into the dome ceiling. You know, at the, at the heart of my gesture, you know, was the act of say liberating these beings, these figures from whiteness, you know, what possible reclamation and agency could be gained, you know, with, without the surrounding whiteness that they were, you know, previously resigned to. You know, so in a sense, the subjugated, those deemed lowly were, in a sense, elevated to the divine, you know, and of course, gold leaf, you know, makes reference to Renaissance and Byzantine churches, in a way, elevating them to saints, but I was also thinking about celestial beings and and constellations and stars. And, you know, my hope was for these figures, you know, in the ceiling to kind of reinforce the notion or possibility of rebirth, definitely spiritually, but also through, you know, the viewers, you know, investigation, interrogation, reckoning with America's complex history. You know, the representation of these black, of these historic figures could maybe point to some sort of futurity of blackness. You know, here, here's a, a detail from the fresco where you have this horse carriage driver. He's seen, you know, taking a rest. And I was trying to think, what, what did I, what should I do with how to place him in this um, new situation? So in my reinterpretation, it becomes almost like this um, dreamlike space in this surreal, surreal, surrealist scene, I think points, probably points directly to the violence of the times as, you know, the resting driver descends in close proximity to the sickle of the field hand who is most likely a slave working the land. So this group of figures, um, 
they're standing at, at the train station, not denied access to the train. And I kept calling them, you know, the witnesses, you know, both to the kind of literal and metaphoric um, witnesses of the atrocities and the oppression of the times. And I turned to Frederick Douglass um, to provide a quote that I felt like peace needed something. So I, to kind of have a quote that could kind of shoulder these, um, these beings around the base of the dome. And so I, I thought about the, the famous July 4th um, speech. And the quote I used is, um, there's not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong for him. Underneath the dome ceiling were these four medallions. And I decided, as you know, I'm thinking about the building is um, dedicated to, it's called Memorial Hall, and it's dedicated to honoring Kentuckians who died in World War I. So I thought maybe these medallions I could have um, honor for maybe underrecognized Kentuckians. So this represents Georgia Powers, who was the first African-American to serve in the Kentucky Senate. She sponsored bills prohibiting employment discrimination, sex discrimination, age discrimination. This represents Chief Redbird, a Cherokee who lived peacefully among the white settlers in Clay County until his murder by two Tennessee men. The two white men were never tried in court. Um, this is Peter Durrett, a former slave and preacher who founded First African Baptist Church in Lexington, Kentucky in 1790. And, you know, I couldn't find any representations of Durrett in any archives. So I decided to portray him as this kind of silhouetted head. You know, this was a popular way of, of making portraits before the invention and, and common use of photography in the 1800s. But in a sense, I was, I was forced to present Peter Durrett as this almost anonymous figure. Um, and, you know, and of course it speaks to who gets to be remembered, whose image in the 1800s was worthy of being documented, painted, recorded, preserved, who gets to be in the archive. And this is Charlotte Dupuy, again, um, silhouetted head, um, who was an enslaved African-American woman who filed a freedom suit in 1829 against her master, Henry Clay, who at the time was our, our country's secretary of state. You know, this case actually went to court um, 17 years before the Dred Scott filed his more le famous legal challenge to slavery. So after Clay's tenure in Washington, DC, Dupuy refused to return to his home in Kentucky and was jailed. So the piece is called Witness, and I, I, I felt like I needed a piece that was a, a title that was, you know, both a, a noun and a, and a verb. It was important for the, my insertion to kind of serve the site. You know, it's an academic institution where the piece had to be maybe layered enough where repeat view, for knowing that the, the population, you know, students, staff, faculty are going to see it over and over. So I was hoping in a way I could do something that was layered enough where I'm also, in a sense, activating history. I'm trying to keep it alive and rooted in the present tense. You know, my hope was for the piece to be useful, a teaching tool for the school to use. You know, it's, to me, it was pretty obvious certain disciplines that could possibly use it. Of course, art history, religion, economics, history, African-American studies and African studies. And I was thinking too of the complex and kind of various interpretations of gold. Yes, it could elevate you know, these anonymous figures to the divine. But gold leaf can also be interpreted as a literal reminder of when the time when blacks were only valued as currency, as commodity. And I was also thinking too about the trading and sometimes theft of gold from Northern and, and Sub-Saharan Africa during the Roman Empire. So on, on June 5th, 2020, you know, in the wake of demands for a racial justice prompted by the murder of George Floyd, the university's president decided, made this, announced the decision to remove the O'Hanlon mural. And to me, it felt a bit like a quick fix, you know, to quell the black fury that was being felt from, you know, Lexington to Louisville. Um, the decision to remove the O'Hanlon mural also rendered my work witness blind and mute. You know, it cannot exist without the past it sought to confront. And, and it felt ironic that the decision to censor this historic artwork and one fell swoop censored my installation as well. You know, instead of, you know, embracing the polemics, the two works engendered a thoughtful dialogue between the work of a white woman in 1934 and it was, a, and it was actually the largest uh, fresco by a woman at, at that time with, you know, black women of today as seemingly kind of good deed was kind of offered up to members of the community who opposed the mural as opposed to doing kind of the real work that demanding more faculty of color and all those, the real work. Um, you know, so I ended up writing an op-ed in, in the Washington Post shortly after the decision was made. And, and in it, I said, this is just a quote, 
Witness was not created to magically dispel or absolve the University of Kentucky from embedded institutional white supremacy and oppression. You know, when I finished the piece, I assumed that the university, that would be when the university would begin its real work. Um, I thought there'd be some sort of inclusion and pro some sort of programming or seminars or some place where it would be in the curriculum. You know, I thought it could be a site where the community could really, one of the ways, um, tools for the university to be able to community to kind of wrestle with the very problematic, paradoxical, and simultaneous and fragmented histories and the relationships of these disparate histories today and the now. You know, so it, it was it's it's a bit heartbreaking, you know, and a strange feeling too, you know, it feels as though it's they've kind of rendered these black and brown figures anonymous once again, you know, for a second time. You know, this is this attempt to kind of offer what I hope would be agency and autonomy for autonomy for these 25 souls um, feels as though it was dismissed. So this is an image of MOVE, um, members of MOVE. And MOVE was a black liberation group founded in West Philly in 1972. And they were subject to periodic police confrontations and violence, stirred mostly by their anarcho primitivist lifestyle. You know, confrontations, continue to grow. In this image, you could see uh, one of the members is barricading and sealing off the compound. So on May 12th, 1985, which was Mother's Day that year, the police issued eviction and arrest warrants to move and instructed folks living in the vicinity to vacate their homes until the following evening. So a standoff ensued and the police helicopter dropped a bomb on the move compound. Then the famous, you know, orders were, were, were given by the mayor to let the fire burn. So 11 MOVE members were murdered, including five children. Here you can see the, the devastation. So this is a photograph of Ann Jarvis, who was a West Virginia native who moved to Philadelphia. And in 1907, she began a campaign to establish a national holiday for Mother's Day. And the carnation was her, her it came to, came to symbolize that holiday was her mother's favorite flower. Um, I, but I think about that history, but I was also thinking how it exists in different cultural contexts. In, in Jamaica, it's a funerary flower, um, corsages for high school proms. And I was thinking we all kind of possibly have some sort of relationship to this flower, even if it might be just as a cheesy flower or a cheap flower. So for my exhibition at the ICA in 2020, carnation, pin, carnation pins were offered to museum goers instead of the traditional little metal pins. And I wanted to acknowledge MOVE, whose headquarters are located just a couple miles away from the museum. And I wanted to think about Mother's Day, you know, the day before the horror that transpired in the city. You know, so I was thinking of this, this MOVE piece in relationship to the Stumbling Stone Holocaust Memorial, where these bronze plaques are placed in the front of homes of those victimized and killed um, during the Nazi regime. To me, I, I, I got to, I spent a year in Rome and I, I saw them all everywhere. And it was to me, one of the most moving um, memorials I've ever experienced and kind of in awe of its scale and, and it being the, the most decentralized memorial um, found throughout Europe. So I was interested in what it would be to offer these corsages and through this collective act of wearing or holding the carnation, we form a, a temporary physical community in the museum that then you know, disperses to the city and beyond, you know, I wanted to create almost like a monument, um, but this monument would be have an intimate and mobile relationship to the body. So in this act, you know, we invert monuments, you know, presumed scale and fixity. So this piece is called Fortified, and this is part of that same exhibition. And so I built this 15 by 30 foot wall with the help of four other um, amazing artists. Um, and it literally became part of the architecture, part of the infrastructure. You know, it looms massive, it feels really impenetrable. You know, I think about walls, I'm kind of obsessed with walls for many years at this point. Um, I think about their disparate functions. You know, they can act as borders, they can act as shelter, they can protect some people that's out. They are signifiers of pow power. So I decided what, what can I do to kind of destabilize that? So I thought, or just to shift how I was thinking, I was also thinking when I was, you know, Trump being in office and there was lots of things at the, the border wall, um, so I decided here, instead of mortar, the bricks are held together um, with used clothing. And then when you get close up to the wall, the wall reveals itself to be quite porous. You know, the cracks are exposed between the bricks. You know, so what was assumed to be this kind of solid impasse kind of falls apart and instead it's malleable and mutable. 
and some more detail shots. There was this feeling when you were standing close and looking up, there was a feeling of the walls instability. I was also hoping to do this toggle maybe between the too muchness of the, you know, hundreds of bodies that previously wore these clothes, this clo these clothes pieces of um, these garments, you know, the anonymous, but also this kind of up close intimacy of say, you know, these, this infant's onesie. So you have that experience. And then when you turn around, you kind of turn the bend, the experience is, is, is very different. Um, all of a sudden you kind of confronted with this almost like a tsunami of clothing, you know, and I think of, you know, this wall as, as a monument as well, you know, to human costs, you know, it speaks to the force, might and will to construct it, you know, and of course we could, in, in, in my most optimist moment, thinking that, you know, most empires and oppressive systems, you know, they can be dismantled too, you know, brick by brick. So I, I was a fellow at the American Academy in eight, 2018 to 19, and I was offered an opportunity to create um, six site-specific installations at this site called um, Le Morate. It's this incredible art, art institution and cultural center in Florence. And the site was a, a former 14th century um, Florentine convent for cloistered nuns. I mean, Le Morate means like walled, walled up. And so it was a, it was, it was a it was for nuns till in the, in the 14th century. And then by the late 19th century, it was converted to a prison and remained one until 1985. And I kept thinking about the relationship between um, a prison, prison population and what, what they share with maybe cloistered nuns. Um, so, after, so in 1985, it became this cultural center. So I decided, so I'm gonna just show one project from this, um, this, um, this site. So, I did, created an audio installation in the, in the former jail cells that were you know, dedicated to isolating prisoners, the solitary confinement. So the recording is an Italian translation of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, King's famous um, letter from Birmingham jail. And it's performed by a local activist, Antonella Bunda, who's a first generation Florentine from Sierra Leone. And the 53 minute recording, there was something kind of haunting, kind of filled the space and I was, uh, I, I'm just going to play a little um, excerpt. Per onestà devo confessare due cose a voi, miei fratelli cristiani ed ebrei. In primo luogo, devo confessare che negli ultimi anni i bianchi di opinioni moderati mi hanno dato una grave delusione. Starei quasi per arrivare alla spiacevole conclusione che nel cammino dei neri verso la libertà l'ostacolo maggiore non è l'aderente al White Citizens Council o l'affiliato del Ku Klux Klan, bensì il bianco moderato che ha a cuore l'ordine più della giustizia, che preferisce la pace negativa, ossia l'assenza di tensioni, a una pace positiva, ossia la presenza della giustizia, che dice sempre Sono d'accordo con voi per quanto riguarda gli obiettivi che vi prefiggete, ma non posso essere d'accordo con i vostri metodi di azione diretta. Che crede nel suo paternalismo di poter essere lui a determinare le scadenze della libertà di un altro. Che vive secondo un concetto mitico del tempo e continua a consigliare ai neri di attendere un momento più propizio. La scarsa comprensione da parte di persone ben disposte è ben più frustrante dell'assoluta incomprensione mostrata da chi è mal disposto. L'accettazione tiepida sconcerta assai più del rifiuto secco. Prima di concludere, mi sento in dovere di citare ancora un punto della vostra dichiarazione che ha suscitato in me un profondo turbamento. Il caloroso elogio che rivolgete alla polizia di Birmingham per aver mantenuto l'ordine e impedito atti di violenza. Dubito che la vostra lode sarebbe stata altrettanto calorosa se aveste visto i cani della polizia affondare i denti nella carne di neri disarmati e non violenti. Dubito che avreste avuto tanta fretta nell'elogiare i poliziotti se aveste potuto osservare il modo sgradevole e disumano in cui trattano i neri qui nella prigione cittadina se li aveste visti mentre prendevano a spintoni e insultavano anziane donne e ragazze nere, se li aveste visti prendere a schiaffi e a calci neri vecchi e giovani, se li aveste visti 
come è accaduto in due occasioni, mentre si rifiutavano di darci da mangiare perché volevamo cantare insieme la preghiera di ringraziamento per il nostro cibo. Nelle logge della polizia di Birmingham non posso unirmi a voi. Um, I'm going to show this sculpture um, that I, 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 I still have so many ideas are swimming around um, in my head and heart with this. So this piece is called um, How Many Ways Can You Disappear? And it consists of lobster fishing uh, pot warp recovered from Matinicus Island uh, in Maine, a 13 foot long salt casted rope and expired buoys. And the, the ropes lay limp without function, but I keep kept thinking they still hold the sea, they hold history, memories, loss. I was thinking about what remains from the tangle of rope, it's a crystallized salt. And I was thinking of salt's history, you know, and trade and currency, I was also thinking about the practice of trading slaves for salt in ancient Greece. So the title came from this um, poem, Return Number 14, by this incredible poet, Canisia Lubrin. I'm going to just read an excerpt. How many ways can you disappear a people, dignity by dignity, slant word by slant word who turn grave, grave by grave by the curve and measure of graves after typhoons, cyclones, the mounting electro wastelands by the fresh water, a wrath of, of tumors as bright, as, as bright brush on the forehead or covering over knees, the work of minutes grating against millions in flooded cities. How many ways can you empty a people, hope by hope, i do not venerate men at all. I have a problem with dream. So I'm going to share one of my projects from last summer's Documenta. So I was invited um, by this collective, um, this artist collective in Trinidad and Tobago called um, Alice Yard. So I spent about a week there and I've been doing all this research trying to figure out what to do. Um, but after after I spent time there, I kept going back to the star-studded documenta from 40 years before that included, you know, Joseph Boys, and uh, uh, most people know that 7,000 Oaks, which forever changed, if ever Mark Castle's landscape, I feel like in a way that piece is a, was like a monument. Um, but I was also thinking about Klaus Oldenburg, and he had just had recently passed. And I was thinking about his contribution, this, this piece titled Pickaxe. So I was thinking about that, but then I started thinking, I, I have to, engage, I want to find a way to engage Trinidad. So I thought of uh, one of my favorite places in Trinidad called Brasso Seco. And this particular location, what we're looking at is where the Pariah River meets the sea. So I created this poster and I'm going to read the title. <clears throat> so in parentheses, out, cast, pickaxe by Claus Aldenberg, Efolda River, parentheses, castle. Um, driftwood at the edge of Pariah River parentheses, Brasos Seco. There is always a city. There is always a civilization. There is always a barbarian with a pickaxe. Sometimes you are the city. Sometimes you are the civilization. But to become that city, that civilization, you once took a pickaxe and destroyed what you hated. And what you hated is what you did not understand. That is a quote from Jeanette uh, Winterson. And it was important for my poster to engage these two disparate, very specific locales, Castle Germany and, and Trinidad. And I thought, you know, this year's, that year's iteration of um, documenta filled with mostly black and brown artists and wondering what its legacy would be beyond the kind of relentless controversy coverage. So the, the poster was wheat pasted on the exterior wall of Truffle House in Castle, which houses this independent radio station and it's a multi-space. And simultaneously on the exterior wall of Grandison Lab, which is a cultural center in Belmont, Trinidad. So what was exciting about this piece is my piece was only up for like a week. Each week a new um, poster was repasted over the current one. And I really enjoy the temporal nature of the artwork, which kind of reflected the changing nature and the use of the site, kind of worked hand in hand. I'm gonna show it, uh, stay in the kind of billboard poster vein. I'm gonna show an older work I did um, after grad school when I lived in Houston and I, won a, a public art grant to create this billboard in um, the third ward section of Houston, which is very a block or two away from Project Row Houses. You know, and I was thinking really aware of, um, you know, the negative advertising that happens in black neighborhoods, you know, liquor, fast food, cigarettes. And I was thinking, you know, it doesn't have to be that. It could be, um, we could decide what to, to advertise. We could celebrate ourselves. 
So I built this billboard structure and took a photograph of a couple guys who used to hang out in the park. And I was hoping it could kind of open a discourse, kind of remind each other that this is our community as, and we belong here as the gentrification was beginning. You know, I hope to call attention, you know, to like fleeting moments, you know, simple gestures, like brief exchanges that create kind of the meaning in our lives. You know, for me, this is, this a, a, a billboard is, can easily be a monument. You know, we can collectively decide what to celebrate, who to celebrate, how to celebrate, who to honor, revere, and remember. You know, so when I was installing it late at night, I was having really problems with the vinyl. And um, this guy came up to me and he recognized Al, the guy on the left, and he made, made some comment about how he always has a smirk on his face. Then he mentioned Will, who's in the middle. And he said, you know, Will always has that sad look in his eyes. And I swear, he said, oh, I got to call him up. And I was thinking, that's exactly what I want the piece to be like. Remind us that we are still here. Um, and it makes me also think of this um, old Irish proverb that I first discovered through a poem um, by Padre Gautuma. Um, and the quote is, um, it is in the shelter of each other that the people live. So I think that's where I kind of wanted this piece to exist. So putting up billboards, like finals are really inexpensive. So the idea was my piece would be up and then it just rotate and Project Row House was kind of overseeing it. So someone put a portrait of their family. Um, this is a photo of two members of the new Black Panther Party in Houston. This was like a PSA about food insecurity and sustainability. And then this happened, the Manila Museum did an ad campaign and somehow they got access to the billboard structure. I don't know if maybe um, the community board decided, you know, they could use the money. Um, but what I love is that someone in the neighborhood announced put up a counter billboard. So the Manila one is an image of a detail of a painting of Luke Toyman's. And in the foreground, someone did a similar portrait of Tupac Shakur. And what I loved about that was, I just love that it was anonymous, but I also love that um, the, the artwork is no longer mine. The authorship is gone. You know, an old friend, when all this was going on, an old friend texted me and said, I can't remember, did you originally put that original billboard up? And for me, you know, I think about how public art is functioning best when the public is not thinking about the author of the piece, like in a way it's functioning in the world, you know, as it should. Um, I'm gonna share um, a project that I'm designing and working on now, a memorial project. I'm gonna read this quote first. Whereas our ancestors, not of choice, were the first successful cultivators of the walls of America, we, the descendants, feel ourselves entitled to participate in the blessings of her luxuriant soil. So that is a quote from Richard Allen. Richard Allen founded the African, Baptist, African Methodist Episcopal Church which was the first independent black denomination in the United States. He also bought land in 1810 to create a uh, Bethel Burying Ground, a, a, a black cemetery. And I just wanna honor um, today, um, on a 74 year old Jane Ginn who died on this date, January 25th in 1849 of cramp colic. She was buried at Bethel Burying Ground. So I, I, I feel so um, honored to be entrusted to kind of create this memorial, you know, that's honoring more than 5,000 African-Americans buried at Bethel Burying Ground. There's some estimates that it could be as many as 8,000 are buried there. So Bethel was discovered at the site of this playground in South Philly. And when I began my research for the, memor the memorial, I, I, did, I did a couple of things. I was I kind of exhausted this local historian um, Terry Buckaloo made this has this impressive archive um, of those buried at the at the at the at the cemetery, and then I was kept looking at aerial views of cemeteries and made this kind of imaginary one using composites of actual cemeteries. And I was struck by how you know headstones and how they're kind of the defying um, signifier of the land, and how at Bethel Burying Ground only one one headstone has been dis recovered in all this time, and it, it reads, um, Amelia Brown, 1819, aged 26 years, whosoever live and believeth in me, though we be dead, yet shall we live. And this led me to the discovery of this illustration of graves at First African Baptist Church in, um, Cemetery in Philadelphia. And I thought about Richard Allen, you know, his kind of amazing foresight, kind of born out of necessity a buying land for a black cemetery. The, the limitations were many in the 1800s. Blacks couldn't be buried in white churchyards and restricted to the public potter's field. 
you know, this act of Allen's, you know, ensured dignity and death for the thousands who often endured a lack of dignity and respect in life. You know, I was so struck by the kind of the magnitude of the racism that we, we know was embedded during their lives, but also by its kind of echo and reach in death. You know, that little plot of land in 50 years was forced to accommodate, you know, more and more of the dead, stacked graves on top of stacked graves because of, you know, governmental laws and societal norms of oppression that limited access to appropriate burial sites. You know, the knowledge of this density, you know, was, you know, we result of entrenched, you know, racist policies that kept leading me back to these horrific illustrations that we've all seen. You know, when you think of the density of the burials and the cemetery, it's hard not to also think about the cramped ships of the Middle Passage, you know, Blacks weren't afforded, you know, dignity of space, you know, in life or death. So during my research, I was, you know, conscious of the fact that, you know, those buried are still on that land, you know, within the borders of the playground. You know, how could we best honor them knowing that, you know, most of them have stories that we that will never be recounted. And I thought, you know, let me begin with the fact that it's still a cemetery. Um, so I researched, you know, 19th century cemetery gates with their kind of grandeur and beauty and um, kind of undeniable presence. And you know, they created this physical delineation and threshold between the secular and the sacred. You know, they provided that barrier between, you know, the bustle of the city or the town with the serene and more pastoral, you know, grounds of, the, of eternal rest. You know, here, these are some that are in, in Philadelphia. So I thought, you know, Bethel Burying Grounds boundary, you know, was, a, I knew it was originally a, a simple brick wall, but I was interested in what it would do to, to the playground and its current use to transcribe this more illustrious, you know, entrance to the burying ground section of the playground. I thought about what it could point to, you know, to have two very distinct looking entrances, you know, one unchanged, unchanged that leads to the, to the playground, the obvious site for play, and the other completely transformed. And I was thinking this, you know, this, this new threshold would signify that this is a site to revere, a site to gather, a site to honor. These are some of my renderings, you know, so they're gonna be engraved on white granite and concrete pavers with inscriptions that reflect, you know, fragmented biographies of those hidden on the ground, you know, I'm hoping they can serve to fill in, you know, for the thousands of missing headstones normally seen throughout cemeteries. You know, the inscriptions, you know, are incomplete, but they will hopefully create this impressionistic context for understanding and learning about what life was like in 19th century Philadelphia for the mostly freed African-Americans who called the city home. You know, the words often reveal the tragedy of racism and segregation of the times and and, and, and it's measured, I mean, you could feel, feel it in the disparate illnesses and diseases that were rampant in, the, in that century that affected mostly um, poor folks and black folks. I'm just gonna read one example that will be um, on one of, the, one of the inscriptions. Debility was cited as the cause of death for this nine week old on November 19th, 1820. It is likely that she, like 95 other children with the same annotation starved from a lack of milk. I'm also gonna have some humidity activated concrete pavers for some of the inscriptions. And I'm interested in the idea that all the history won't be revealed at once, the idea that history is revealed. Um, I like the idea that because it's a lot of people repeat viewing that it will keep on shifting and changing. I was also interested in another um, history. The city bought the, when the, once the city bought the the cemetery, at one point it, it was a school garden and an educational project. So I was thinking about the school garden, but I was also thinking about how cradle graves um, were, became, began to appear in American um, cemeteries in the 1800s. And they decided, they were designed to provide, you know, a place for planting flowers. And I, and I think back how, you know, archeologists um, digs show that, you know, the tradition of placing flowers um, with the dead dates back, you know, thousands and thousands of years and has remained, you know, an important part of funerary customs um, all over the world. So I'm also going to have these, um, these um, planters that are shaped like the cradle graves to kind of make reference to those histories. And they'll be full of vibrant living plant and flowers and the community will, will take care of it. Um, so here's an image of a archeological investigation. And what you're seeing here is the original cemetery wall. So there will be a brick pathway that'll follow the known footprint of the cemetery. And, I, and because we know the exact um, delineation, I'm interested in the sense that this 
this in a way it's like unburying or raising of the 19th century um, cemetery wall. And I'm thinking perhaps it could become more, Parkos could become maybe more acutely aware of the physicality of the cemetery and of the physical space that it took up and occupied and still occupies, you know, this clear physical demarcation between the boundary of the living and the dead. And the brick pathway actually extends, the cemetery extends beyond, beyond the wall of the, of, the, of the playground. And I was thinking how it could be, I was thinking like what private thoughts could people have, you know, as they leave the playground, leave the cemetery on their way and they see this, they could be aware of the, the presence underfoot. Um, you know, thinking about the people, the previous neighbors who were, live where, where they live now um, are, are literally underfoot. And I was also interested in maybe this haptic experience of walking on, you know, two types of sidewalk, you know, the, the bricks and, and, the, and the actual um, concrete. And I was thinking too that this, maybe this pathway could also act as, as a palimpsest. You know, so I'm hoping that, you know, this will be this kind of restorative, regenerative, educational um, space that could allow for the gathering of descendants and neighbors and Philadelphians and a place to continue to commune and honor them. I'm gonna show one last thing. Um, and though it's not tied, tightly tied to the ideas of memorials and monuments, but it's my most recent work. So I figured I should um, I, I'd share it. So I recently unveiled a, a, my largest um, public um, piece to date at Newark Liberty Airport's new terminal so the piece is called Approach, and I created these two 52-foot-tall suspended sculptures that fill the two bays and the terminal. And I was trying to capture the robust tapestry of New Jersey, its iconic skylines, its industries, neighborhoods, um, landmarks, its natural beauty. You know, so you have these like slices of land and sky suspended in these two kind of helix-like structures. One of them depicts daytime, and the other night. This is the daytime one. And I'm hoping, you know, again, to surprise, surprise visitors and maybe invoke an immediate sense of place. You know, each ring is double-sided and presents two distinct views. So when you're looking up into the sculpture, um, you see bird's eye views. And, and what I, why I was interested in, in inverting that was, well, I'm always thinking about the disorientation we experience when we travel, but when you arrive on the arrivals level, you look up into the sculpture and you see a view that you likely would have seen as you were descending. And looking at the bird's eye view. So I was interested in that, that, that play that could happen. Uh, and when you look up, uh, when, you're looking, when you're looking down into the sculpture, you're seeing the views that you would normally see looking up. You see skyward views. Here's a couple of details. Uh, there's like infinite perspectives that you can photograph from or experience. I'm hoping it could kind of you know, perhaps spotlight was already, what's always been there. Like here's different, here's a conflation of the Jersey, the Jersey Shore, the tarmac, the, the turnpike, but somehow maybe allow it to be beautiful again, or maybe to sharpen a lens on it. This is a, a, a little video I did from the, from the elevator. And I was thinking maybe it could remind us of the wonder and magic and the awe that I still feel about travel. I still think it's this magical thing that I can't believe we get to do this, even though it's a pain in the ass and all that stuff, but there's still something kind of amazing about it. So this is the second one. So this one betrays nighttime views. So near the ceiling is a mirrored header. So when you look down, you're seeing sky views, but the mirror allows you to reflect back and return the sky images to the sky. And I was there the other day and I caught this toddler with her dad looking up into it, which was very exciting. You know, so it's interesting the fact that these images are a record. They're a record of a specific moment, you know, but our movements, our particular vantage point, our unique perspective shifts how we see what we see and how we interpret and process what we see. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Karen. So we'll open it up for questions if audience members wanna use the Q&A feature 
I can get you started with a quick one. Um, one of the things that was really interesting across all the projects was that sense of embodiment um, and the ways that that audiences and people that live in communities share in the experience of the memorials. Could you talk a little bit about some of the aftermath of the different projects? You alluded to it a little bit at Kentucky, but I was thinking particularly of the battle is joined in Germantown, just how, what sense you have of how community members may have engaged differently with their spaces um, after the piece yeah. was done. Well, I could talk about before and in between and after, I guess I could the day we were started began installing, I had a, a, a neighbor, neighborhood guy come up to me and say, he was angry. He's like, how much did this piece cost? 20, I, he said, $25,000. I said, close to it, 28. He's like, don't you know people are starving here? And I said, yes, because I live in this community. And we actually ended up having this like three hour conversation. And we talked about why can't we have beauty? Yes, this piece isn't going to solve poverty. But what does it mean to see ourselves reflected? Should this only be downtown and center city or in Society Hill and fancy neighborhoods? Like, what does it mean that we could see ourselves? I had a woman towards the end of the run say to me, they must know we're still here. Like they haven't forgotten we, we, we're here. Prayer circles happened around this piece. Um, I had a vet who I, I know was, um, I knew he was struggling because every day I would see him there with his brown paper bag you know, and I would see him get less and less, he would become more and more uh, inebriated. And one day, I don't know what, he would always just nod at me. One day, I don't know what made him come and speak to me, but he came up to me and said, I had to kill that woman and child. I'm a, I'm a Marine, I'm a Marine for life. And we just hugged. So there's something about that piece that people claimed it. I had someone, you know, a pessimist the first day say, people are gonna graffiti it. No one respects anything. There are people who became stewards of it, who cleaned it. Someone left trash on it, which rarely happened. But there are people who made sure it was kept clean. The only thing that was ever, the only way it was ever defaced was a smiley sticker that a kid put on. So there was something about that. I mean, I had someone, I mean, there's there's a reenactment of the Battle of, Battle of um, um, Germantown every year. And I, there was, I got some hate mail from that because they felt as though I was defacing it. But I was trying to explain to them that this is very similar to this is a remix. This is a this is a just this is the equivalent of a reenactment. This is a making a contemporary. And it was interesting. I had some people say, I mean, of course there are people who wish it stayed up, but there was something about people recognizing, doing what I would hoped, like thinking about, okay, if I see myself reflecting this in this in this monument, what is my responsibility as a citizen? And there was conversations about that. And I still see people who still talk about about it and they talk about how they never knew what was there. <laughs> and then actually thinking about it, never paying attention to the Pistorius one. And an interesting thing was the Pistorius monument was in disarray. It was ratchet, there were ratchet straps holding it together. And I do think my piece helped the city to realize they need to take care of and honor um, this Pistorius monument, not just focus on the, the battle, the Revolutionary War battle. So that's an example of one where mm -hmm. it, it the, the community, it, it really was not mine. It, the community took it, mm -hmm. you know? Good, thank you, Karen. Yeah. Um, our next question is about the University of Kentucky project. So any indication of what the university plans to do in the now covered up wall spaces in Memorial Hall? Um, that's a thing. I, th I think it was in the news again recently, Wendell Berry, I think there, there was another article, I think in the Times more recently about it. Um, I've been trying to speak to the, the I've, I've been in conversation with the university because um, they, it, it seems as though they thought I would just leave up my piece. But I said that then the piece doesn't have any a context, it doesn't make any sense. So I think they're still working through the extreme cost of taking down a fresco and storing it. They've been speaking about this since you know 2020 and it hasn't quite happened yet, I think because the cost is exorbitant. Um, but I did tell them that I will need to deinstall it in a way that gives some sort of respect and agency to, to these. It's not just, an, it's, again, it's a public artwork, it's, it's not mine, 
but in a way, like I have to take care of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I told him it might mean that I and might need a film crew. I might need something. I might be, I need to be there and for a month taking it down slowly. I don't know what it is, but I, it's mm-hmm. going to, I can't just let it be, you know, whitewashed <laughs> over. Sure. There has to be something of the unearthing of what I try to pull out of it and the new context around it. I feel like I have to, I owe it to, I owe it to those figures. I also feel like on some level, I owe it to Anne O'Hanlon, who actually at the time, it, it, for all the problematics of that piece, um, she could have chose not to have um, black folks in it. There's another mural fresco that's in the library that's called Work. It doesn't have a single white um, black person in the in the fresco, and no one's protesting that one. I'm mm-hmm. like, that's offensive. <laughs> mm-hmm. So it, it's it's complicated, you know. Mm. Yeah, and it does seem like the university is not quite willing to own the history, but then wants to have all the protection about the actual piece itself. Right. In, in or it's like, I mean, and the reason why I did the, the op-ed was, I mean, the week before, I remember HBO said they had pulled Gone with the Wind and they were working on the language to contextualize that film. Like, we still, we have to show it because it's a masterpiece, but didn't. So that thought of it, made me think about like this piece could have been a tool. It's not a Confederate monument, which has a whole different history and those should all go away. Mm-hmm. This was something else. And because it was in a place of higher education where there was space for this to actually be used to be a cap, to be a tool. And that's why what led me to say, okay, this might be worthy of writing, trying to write, write something about it. Yeah, good. Well, Karen, I'm, we're up against the end of our time block here, but I wanna thank you so much for your your presentation and giving us so much to think about. Um, the appreciation comes both from myself, from Rhino College, from the Center for Studying Structures of Race and from Creative Time. Um, thanks also so much to our audience members for attending this evening. Um, and everyone who is in attendance, especially those on campus are invited to come back on February 8th. That's a Wednesday at 4 p.m. for the next lecture in this series, which will be given by Ainsley Carey, who's written important work on Uh, building names and the echoes of white supremacy on campus spaces. So Karen, thank you again very much. um, And to all in the audience, have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye.